Hello, you are watching the 3 ABN Sabbath School panel. And as always, we want to thank you for taking this faithful journey with us each and every week through the scriptures as we take on a new lesson, a new quarterly lesson each quarter. And of course, this quarter in 2024, first quarter, we're talking about the book of Psalms. We're making our way through a deep study of Psalms. And I tell you, I've learned so much and I've been blessed by this study. Before we go any further, I do want to remind you all that uh, if you are interested in having a copy of each panelist lesson, uh, that is the, the study notes for our lesson. Uh, we're making that available for you. We've made this announcement a few times, but we're going to continue to make this because it's something new that we're doing. And I do want to make mention that uh, sometimes as you're listening to 3 and Sabbath School panel, you'll find out that sometimes we as individual uh, students of the Word, um, we will leave some of the content for you to study and read from the lesson yourself, but then God will give us some insight that we also feel needs to be shared or we want to share that's a little bit of extra stuff that may not be directly in the lesson. So if you get a copy of our notes and it looks a little different than the actual study lesson itself, that's okay. It's just some more information and more uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, study material that you'll have for your lessons as well. So how do you get that? If you want the lessons, you go send us an email to ssp at 3abn.org. Again, that email is ssp for Sabbath School Panel at 3abn.org. Who are our panelists? We have Ms. Shelley Quinn. I'm excited to be joining the panel and the lesson on Monday is teach us to number our days. Amen. And to your left, we have Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Ryan. I have Tuesday's lesson and it's entitled The Lord's Test. Amen. All right. And then, of course, for Wednesday's lesson, Pastor Johnny Denzi. It's a blessing to be here as well. And I do have Wednesday, Deceitfulness of the Wicked Way. Wonderful. And of course, last but not least, Professor Daniel Perrin. Yes, I have Thursday's lesson, which takes us to a conclusion, Blessings of Righteous Living. All right, wonderful. I'm excited about this. By the way, my name is Ryan Day, and I will be covering Sunday's lesson, which is entitled, uh, Your Word I Have Hidden in My Heart. And so before we go any further, I think we should definitely have a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right into our study. So Daniel Perrin, would you have a prayer for us, brother? Sure. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us in your word everything we need for life and godliness. Mm -hmm. And I thank you that as we look into there, you reveal it to us through the Holy Spirit, guide our thoughts, guide our words, guide our study, and then guide us to heaven with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm, amen. 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 You know, normally I will jump right into reading, especially when I host. I like to cover Sabbath afternoon's messages there because it helps to set a real clear foundation. But there was so much in Sunday's lesson that I'm actually going to skip out on reading Sabbath school or Sabbath afternoon's lesson. And I want you, I'm going to encourage you to read that at home. Our memory text for this week comes from Psalm 90 and verse 12. Of course, this is quoted from the New King James Version. It says, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And of course, Sunday's lesson, as I said earlier, is entitled, Your Word Have I Hidden in My Heart? And of course, this is taken directly from Psalm 119, verse 11. And that's actually where we're going to begin our journey today. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1 of Psalm 119. And to preface this reading, the question that the lesson is asking here is, how should we keep the commandments? And what are the blessings that come from doing that? Now, I had a rather large section of 119 to read, but I don't know that we're going to have all the time, but we're going to try to cover as much as we can. Psalm 119, beginning with verse 1, notice what the Bible says. It says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His testimonies, who seek Him with their whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in His ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. I will praise you with uprightness of heart. When I learn your righteous judgments, I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me 
utterly. I love this chapter because uh, David is just again pouring out his heart to the Lord and recognizing the righteousness of God. In fact, that's the similar to the overall title that we'll have this week in lesson number eight, Wisdom for Righteous Living. And that's exactly what, uh, what David here is, is approaching. He's approaching revealing how we tap into or how we connect to the righteous character and love of God. And I love what he says here in verse, uh, let's see, where, we, where did I find that? He says uh, right here in verse five, oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. You see, when we look at the law of God, uh, the law of God, the commandments does not bring us righteousness. It's not our means by which we are saved. But when we look into that beautiful, perfect law of love, we see where we don't match up. And that's where David is. He's hinting at that. Lord, when I look into it, I feel ashamed. But the more and more that I seek you, there will come a time in which I will look into your law and I will not be ashamed. Let's pick back up in verse 9. We're going to read on to verse 16 and then we'll make some, uh, some points after that. So verse 9 says, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. And I just want to make a note there, uh, the beginning of verse 10 there, with my whole heart I have sought you. That's the key. That's the key right there. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 14. What does Jeremiah say there? He, or actually, God's speaking to Jeremiah. He says, when you search for me with all of your heart, I find that many people struggle in their walk with God and they struggle with the concept of the righteousness that we find in the law of God, which is a reflection of God's character. And they say, oh, I can't measure up to that. Well, none of us can measure up to that in and of our own strength. But as we search for God and we seek him daily with all of our heart, of course, God meets us and he empowers us with that which we cannot empower ourselves with. Continuing on in verse 11, this is our key verse here for this particular lesson. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. Mm -hmm. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. I love this. Let's go back and look at some of the key words here, starting with verse 11. I have hidden, notice your word I've hidden in my heart. Okay. Uh, he goes on to say, with my lips, I have declared, I rejoice in the ways of your testimony. I will meditate and contemplate all of these words that are being used to someone who is beholding. Change in our life does not come all in one big giant leap. It does not happen all in one single day. But what we find is a transformation in the life, that sanctifying aspect of our relationship with God happens over time. It's a process. And that's exactly what we're going to be establishing here. That's what David is bringing out here, that the more he beholds God's righteousness, the more that he focuses his energies, his time, and he meditates on the Lord, he contemplates on God's righteousness. It's because he's beholding God's righteousness, because he's beholding the grace, the love, the compassion, the wonderful character of God, he also becomes changed over time. Now, my friends, I want to make this very clear because many people will read this chapter and it seems very, very commandment saturated. And it certainly is because David is bringing out and emphasizing the importance of the commandments in the Christian walk with God. We cannot remove them, but yet also salvation does not come through the commandments in and of themselves. Now, that being said, I wanted to read this from education page 105 to 106 because many people have this idea, this very legalistic idea that somehow uh, perfection comes uh, through uh, uh, just this one big giant moment when you just completely stop sinning all in a moment and never sin for the rest of your life. Now, obviously, we're seeking and we're searching as we grow. God changes us. He shapes us and molds us into his character. And that which we used to do habitually, we don't do anymore because we are transformed into a new creature in Christ. But I want to read this in education, page 105 and 106. I think it brings to our understanding how this perfection process happens within the law, within the, uh, the, the uh, concept or the uh, understanding of God's law. It says the germination of the seed represents the beginning of spiritual life. So think of planting a seed and you're wanting that to grow and produce fruit. 
It says the development of the plant is a figure of the development of character. There can be no life without growth. The plant must either grow or die. As it grows, okay, or as its growth is silent and imperceptible, but continuous, so is the growth of character. At every stage of development of our life, we may obtain perfection. In fact, it actually says, at every stage of development of our life may be perfect. But if God's purpose, if, but yet if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be constant advancement. Does righteousness come at one time? Obviously, we can be declared righteous. We can be pardoned. We can be brought into a saving relationship with Christ. But that perfect but perfect character is developed over time. And at every stage of growth, from one level of Christian character development to the next, we obviously can grow in Christ and we will be perfect in every stage. So uh, I want to also read this one. This comes from Acts of the Apostles, page 483. And I love this here. It says, He who would build up a strong symmetrical character, he who would be a well-balanced Christian, must give all and do all for Christ. For the Redeemer will not accept divided service. And that's basically what David is highlighting here in Psalm 119. He's giving himself fully over to the idea that he wants God to be fully in him and through him. He wants to saturate his life with God's righteousness. So God's not going to take divided service. But it goes on to say daily. I love this word. Daily he must learn the meaning of self-surrender. He must study the Word of God, learn its meaning, and obey its precepts. That's what we just read about in Psalm 119. Thus... He may reach the standard of Christian excellence. How often? Mm -hmm. Daily. Okay. And then she repeats again, day by day. God works with him, perfecting the character that is to stand in the time of final test. And she says it again, day by day, the believer is working out before man and angels a sublime experiment showing that the gospel can do or what the gospel can do for fallen human beings. I just wanted to make that clear because Paul even brings this out in, in his writings. For instance, in Romans chapter 1, that famous gospel passage there, that message in verses 16 and 17 when he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Verse 17, though, notice, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. How often? Faith to faith. That is, is written, just as the just shall live by faith. So faith to faith communicates a sense of progressiveness from one level of Christian character development to the next. Second Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, he writes this again. Notice, but we all with unveiled face beholding, that's what David's talking about, beholding, meditating, contemplating daily, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image. How often? from glory to glory. So a sense of progressiveness, just as the spirit of the Lord. And then of course, the very next chapter, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, I love this. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed. How often? Day by day. So again, faith to faith, glory to glory, day by day. It's a process. That's the gospel experience. And yes, we can obtain perfection. We can't have perfection in those every, every stage of growth in our life. But of course, that perfection only comes and that development of character and that righteousness can only be developed in our life if we are contemplating and meditating on the Lord and His law and His word every single day. Amen and amen. Thank you for such an excellent foundation, Ryan. My name is Shelley Quinn. Monday's lesson is teach us to number our days. I want to lay a little foundation before you want to, if you want, you can turn to Psalm 90 because that's where we'll be going. But there's so many people who are new to 3ABN who may not even understand what we're talking about here. So let me lay a little foundation. This is a beautiful thing. In 2 Timothy 1.9, Paul writes to Timothy and he's talking about God who has saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, as you alluded to, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. God's always had this plan of salvation by grace. And it, he talks about it was from eternity past that before the foundation of the world, God had a plan to save us by salvation, by grace. Now, if this came before time began, that indicates that time didn't exist as we know it until God created the earth. 
He created a solar cycle to establish a year, a lunar cycle to establish a month, uh, and 24 day cycle that is about the axis of a 24 hour a day, the time it takes the earth to rotate. And then what about the week? Hmm. Well, the week, there's no visible, this is purely a spiritual thing. Common sense and history tell us that the seventh day, the seven day weekly cycle is a mark of God's authority authority mm -hmm. to establish time periods on the earth. So now here's what we want to say. If God does keep time in heaven, he does it differently than we do here. Mm -hmm. First Timothy 6:16 6, says that God alone has immortality, dwelling in inapproachable life, a light. He is eternal. He's without end or beginning. 2 Peter 3, 8 says, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. So God is immortal. We do not have immor immortality. We are created. All of us have the same problem. We're created mortal. 1,600 times the word soul is used in the Bible. Never once does it refer to immortality. So we will not put on immortality until the second coming, which I think we're going to get to here. But James says in James 4, 14, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for just a brief time and then it vanishes away. If we think about humanity, the time of our life. If you look at the spectrum of infinity, we're like a little pinprick on that spectrum. That's the length of our life. We do not put on immortality, Paul says, until 1 Corinthians 15, 54, when the corruptible puts on the incorruptible, mortality puts on immortality at the last trumpet. So now let's look at Psalm 90, this is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. And we want to see what Moses has to say to us. Psalm 90 verse one, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So he's placing the human predicament in the context of God's care for his covenant people, isn't he? As their creator. And I would say all people as their creator, the Hebrew word for dwelling place is me'on, and it portrays the Lord as a shelter, as a refuge. So Psalm 90 verse four, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past. Sounds like what Peter said. Mm -hmm. But he, Moses adds, like a watch in the night. A watch in the night only lasted three to four hours. Then verse five, Psalm 90 verse five, you carry them the years away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning, they are like grass which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes the grass and it grows up. And in the evening, it is cut down and withers. I'll tell you, the older you get, the faster you realize how mm -hmm. time mm. has passed. Mm -hmm. Psalm 90 mm -hmm. verse eight, let's jump down to nine, uh, verse eight. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. Mm. But look at what verse 11 says. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. You could look at this in one of two ways. We could say, oh Lord, the power of your anger. But actually, it implies no one has yet to experience the full wrath of God. That God is a merciful God. Mm -hmm. He is not going to 
it, what he wants to save you more than you want to be saved. That's how I'm going to say it. Mm -hmm. He's looking for you to repent so that he can bestow mercy on you. So Psalm 90 verse 12, here is our verse. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Mm. We've got to recognize the brevity of life. None of us are promised even this day. The brevity of life. Humans are here today, we're gone tomorrow. Mm. He's saying, gain a heart of wisdom. Mm. Understand the purpose of life. God created you for an intimate love relationship, a covenant relationship with Him. Mm -hmm. What life is, I look at it as boot camp for eternity. Right. God is teaching us. He's restoring our righteousness by faith. He's preparing us for eternal life. So the wisdom that we need, the heart of wisdom that we need is we need to refuse to live a life that is separated from God. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. We've got to stop resisting His love, mm -hmm. submit to His authority as our sovereign God, and then yield to the Holy Spirit. He will lead us. He not only forgives our sins and righteousness by faith justifies us, declaring us not guilty, but then as He brings us into covenant relationship, Jesus Christ and the Father live in our hearts by faith through the Holy Spirit. That's what Ephesians 3, 16 through 20 tells us, that He is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond anything that we could ask or think. He infuses His righteousness in us and then we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us mm -hmm. as we yield to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Psalm 90 and verse 17. Let the beauty of the Lord, our God, be upon us. Establish the work of your hands. Yes, establish the work of your hands. In our brief life, God will give our lives value and purpose, and He will lead us. We, if we walk in loyalty to Him, obedience that is motivated by love, obedience doesn't save us. Only God can save us. But then He calls us into this relationship. He expects us to walk in obedience. Listen to this, Psalm 103, verse 14 through 18. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, he flourishes. The wind passes over it and it's gone. Mm. And its place is remembered no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant and to those who remember his commandments to do them. Oh Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Mm. Recognize the brevity of life and understand the purpose of life. Repent and accept his will for your life and he will give you an abundant life here and now and eternal life. Mm, amen. Thank you so much for that, Shelly. My friends, you don't want to go anywhere. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be right back in a little while with Tuesday's lesson. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Hello friends, welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to pass it on to Pastor James Rafferty for Tuesday's lesson. 
Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Shelley. I have Tuesday's lesson. My name is James Rafferty, and the title of our lesson for Tuesday is The Lord's Test. We are going to focus or land in Psalm 105, verses 17 to 22. Now, the lesson brings out uh, Psalm 81 and Psalm 95 also, and those are definitely uh, good insights to what we're going to be covering, but our time is going to be focused on Psalm 105, which shows that the trials were, that trials were God's means of testing Joseph's trust in God's Word about his future. And the quarterly references Genesis 37, 5 through 10, and Psalm 105, verse 19. The Hebrew word, sarath, tested in verse 19 conveys a sense of purging, refining, or purifying, the lesson goes on to say. Thus, the goal of God's testing of Joseph's faith was to remove any doubt in Joseph's mind in God's promise and to strengthen Joseph's trust in God's guidance. And that's what we need, friends. We need God as Ryan was sharing, to continue this work, this progressive work of perfecting our characters at every stage so that we can be complete and perfect so that all doubt can be removed in our minds concerning God's promises and our trust in God. And God does that sometimes in ways, well, that are challenging for us as human beings. Sometimes we don't see the end when we're in the process. We don't understand what's going on. And definitely this is what took place with Joseph. Let's pick up in verse 16 of Psalm 105. Moreover, he called, this is talking about God, he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. So this is stepping into the history of what's taking place in Egypt where Joseph is a slave right now, or he's actually in prison uh, in Egypt where there's a famine is coming upon the land or a famine is about to come upon the land. Pharaoh has these dreams of seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And this is kind of summarizing the whole experience. In verse 17, he sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. So Joseph is actually sold into slavery, into bondage by his own family, his brothers, unbeknown to his father, who is bemoaning Joseph's uh, loss, feeling or believing as his brothers, Joseph's brothers told it, the dad that Joseph was probably killed by some kind of wild animal. And so he thinks Joseph is, Joseph is gone forever. Joseph, on the other hand, has been hurt with fetters, verse 18. He was laid in irons because he was accused of um, attacking uh, Potiphar's wife and uh, an accusation of sexual assault was brought against him. It wasn't true. Uh, he was thrown into the, into the prison under um, the Egyptians. And there he sat until, verse 19, the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. So Joseph is going through this trial, this test. Joseph has given his heart completely to God. As he is sold by his brothers and traveling to Egypt, he decides in his mind, in his heart, that this little spoiled kid, this little father's special son, is, is going to completely put his trust in God. And of course, many of us do that in our lives. We, we put our, our whole trust in God. We, we give our lives over to God's hands. We give him you know, all of the anguish and trials we're going through. And yet, in spite of that, he still goes through major trials. He, he still goes through difficulties. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we think, oh, if I give my life to the Lord and especially going through this trial, I'm just going to hand it over to God and God's going to take care of it all and everything's just going to come out smelling like roses and everything's going to be good. Not the case, in, especially in the experience of Joseph and we can see in the experience of many of God's people because God has a greater purpose that we don't always see. He has something else that he's working out in the background and he, he's looking for people as it says here in verse 17, he's looking for people that he can send. He sent a man before them. How did he send him? Well, just like Daniel, he sent him as a slave, as a captive. Uh, he sent him to do captive evangelism, we could say. God is overruling in our lives. Even when we see bad things happening, God has a purpose. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. Now, we don't always know what that purpose is, but we can trust God for it. So it says in verse 20, the king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. Why? Because Joseph had this gift that God had given him. Just like Daniel, he had a gift for interpreting dreams. And Pharaoh had had these dreams about these fat 
cows and these lean cows and these full heads of corn and these uh, diseased heads of corn and he didn't know what they meant and Joseph came and told him, hey, you've got seven years of plenty, you've got seven years of famine and the seven years of plenty are going to come first and then the seven years of famine are going to follow. And because he was able to interpret Pharaoh's dream, Pharaoh made him ruler in Egypt. He made him a lord of his house, verse 21, ruler of all his substance, to bind his princes at his pleasure, to teach his senators wisdom. Israel also came into Egypt. So now Joseph's brothers come to Egypt because of the famine that has spread out toward, toward the whole our region has affected them and their livestock and their future and their hope. And so they've come into Egypt and they've come looking for help from Pharaoh and actually from their brother Joseph that they don't recognize anymore. And Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham and he increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. So we won't look at the history of these last two verses here, but we want to now turn to Genesis chapter 45 where we pick up the story of Joseph's brothers coming to Egypt. In verse 1 of Genesis chapter 45, Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by and he cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. So now the brethren have come that sold him into, Egypt, into slavery. They don't know it's Joseph. He's changed. He doesn't look the same, of course. And they're asking for help for their family. And of course, Joseph remembers everything that they did. And as he, they're talking, they're explaining there. And you can talk, uh, you have to read the whole story to get the, the details. Um, um, but uh, Joseph commands all the guards, all the Egyptians to leave. And Joseph begins to cry. He wept aloud, verse 2, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard him. So they're not even in the room and they hear him weeping aloud. And Joseph said to his brethren, verse 3, I am Joseph, does my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. God sent me. In fact, he goes on here in verse six, for two years, for the two years there have been famine in the land and yet there are five more years in which there shall be neither eating nor harvest. Verse seven again, and God sent me before you to preserve your posterity in the earth to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not, verse eight, it was not you that sent me hither, but God, for he hath made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of all his house, ruler throughout all the land. Go up quickly to my father and say to him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God has made me Lord in Egypt. Come down, tarry not. That's the perspective we get when we look at the big picture. That's the perspective we get in the life of Joseph. In fact, it was so powerful for Joseph. When we think, think about this history, it was so powerful for Joseph that Joseph actually named his first son Manassas in Genesis 49, or excuse me, in Genesis 41, 51. And that word Manassas means causing to forget because God had caused Joseph to forget everything his brothers had done to him. Mm. Right? Because God had a greater purpose and Joseph stepped into that purpose. And Joseph's character, Joseph's faith, Joseph's doubts were all, his doubts were diminished, his character and faith were strengthened. Joseph had grown, as you were saying, uh, Ryan, he had grown. It wasn't that he was a bad person before, he had surrendered his heart to the Lord, but now he had grown in his character, in his faith, in his trust in God. And sometimes God allows trials to come to us so that we can grow. We see this over and over again. For example, Moses was tested uh, on Mount Sinai there when the people were dancing around the golden calf. Joseph was, uh, Moses was tested, depart from them, separate from them. I'm gonna destroy them and make a, you a whole new nation, a whole new denomination. And Moses said, no, Lord, I'm not gonna do that. Blot me out of the book. If you can't save them, I, I will not be saved without them. I don't want to be saved without them. I will be lost with them rather than saved without them. And Moses was being tested. His love was being tested. You can read this in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 319. And you know, we're going to have a test. In these last days, God is going to test us. And God is testing our love for those who who uh, persecute us. As Stephen was being stoned to death, he said, Father, lay not the sin of their charge. As Jesus was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Moses said, I, I will rather be blotted out of the book than be saved without them. God is testing our character. God is testing our hearts. How do we feel toward those who persecute us? Are we gonna be able to stand this test 
in these last days. God is calling us to sing the song of Moses and to sing the song of the Lamb. And He's doing this through His providence that we would trust in Him, that we would trust in the Lord's test in our own lives and come out reflecting the character of God more fully and more perfectly. Amen. 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 It's a blessing to once again hear each and every one of you. This lesson continues with uh, Wednesday and we are looking at deceitfulness of the wicked way. My name is John Dinsey and we are looking at Psalm 141. Let's begin in verse 1. Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Isn't that interesting the way this is expressed? It's like, Lord, I cry out to you. And it's interesting the way that is expressed because it's like he's trying to get God's attention. Lord, 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 I cry out to you. Mm -hmm. Make haste to help me and give ear to my cry, to my voice when I cry out to you. And this is really what's in the heart of each and every one of us. When we approach the Lord in prayer, we want the Lord to hear us. We want Him to, to understand our need, our difficulty, our challenge, and help us in whatever we are facing. Let's move to verse 2. Let my prayer be set before you as incense. And I'm just reading the first part because it uh, captured my attention, this word set before you. It's interesting because you can get a picture of there's my prayer, Lord. Look at it, listen to it, examine it. And it's very interesting because the Hebrew word there means to be firm, be stable, be established. And I looked into a theological word book of the Old Testament, and it's interesting what is quoted. It says, the root meaning is to bring something into being with a consequence that its existence is a certain thing. Established, prepared, and made ready. So there, he's want, he wants his prayer for the Lord to look at it, to listen to it, and examine it, and see, Lord, please make haste to help me. Now, as we can look, continue in verse 2, uh, going back again, let my prayer be set before you as incense. Well, what happens with incense? Incense comes in. You have to take notice of incense because it's there and the scent is such that it captures your attention as well. Let my prayer be set before you as incense. You will notice incense because the uh, scent of it is such that you will take notice absolutely of it. Let my prayer be before you as incense. And now... Listen to the next part. Uh, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Mm -hmm. these, these are very descriptive language in this prayer. And uh, concerning the incense, I want to mention uh, that the incense was offered every morning and every evening before the Lord on the golden altar. And this was before the veil of the sanctuary. And this is... Uh, the prayer is being mentioned, Lord, right before you. I want my prayer right before you. Please make haste to help me. Mm -hmm. Now concerning uh, this, I'm going to do a little sidetrack here as we consider the prayer that is being mentioned here. And I'm quoting to you from the uh, book Adventist Home, page 100, 212. And I want to appeal to the families to have morning and evening worship with your family. And here on page 212, notice what it says. The father is in one sense the priest of the household. And I want to appeal to the fathers to take up that role, to understand you're the priest of the household. You should take the initiative to uh, have this morning and evening worship with your family to set their minds upon the Lord and to bring your prayer concerns before the Lord and to praise the Lord in song. That the way we're living in these days, it makes it somewhat difficult, but we need to understand that this is important. I continue. Laying upon the altar of God the morning and evening sacrifice, the wife and children should be encouraged to unite in this offering and also to engage in the song of praise. Morning and evening, the father as priest of the household, household should confess to God the sins committed by himself and his children through the day. Oh, this is interesting. Did you not know, fathers and mothers, that you're to confess the sins of your children? Yes. And it says, those sins which have come to his knowledge and also to those which are secret, of which God's eye alone has taken cognizance, should be confessed. 
this rule of action zealously carried out by the father and when he is present or by the mother when he is absent will result in blessings to the family. Mm. And you are going to place in the mind of your children the need that we all have to come before the Lord and present ourselves before the Lord in morning and evening. And this will help them throughout their lives. You know, it's interesting that in the Jewish uh, understanding or even their teachings, the fathers are mainly responsible for confessing the sins of their children and they have this whole uh, ceremony, the bar mitzvah, that when they're 13 years of age, they are released in their mind from having to confess the sins of their children. But uh, I believe that as fathers and mothers, we love our children so much that we're going to look at 13 years of age. They even have this, uh, according to uh, F.C. Gilbert, they even have this saying that the father says, I am rid of you. <laughs> I am rid of you. You're on your own. Basically, you are responsible now for your own sins. And really, uh, you can look at Job and he uh, mm -hmm. shows us a good example in what he did to uh, offer sacrifices on behalf of his children uh, to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Let's continue back to Psalm 141, verse 3. Powerful declaration made here. Uh, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Wow. We all need to do that. We all need to ask the Lord to set a guard on our mouth because uh, some things that come out of our mouth uh, should never come out of our mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. You know, I, I, even, uh, I have even heard, if I weren't a Christian... <laughs> If I weren't a Christian, you know, I would do this and that to you. And so you've already said it. You already spoke what's in your mind. Let uh, our prayer also be, Lord, set a guard over my mouth mm -hmm. and uh, keep watch over the door of my lips. Why does David ask the Lord to set a guard over his mouth? Mm -hmm. He may have uh, uh, brought to his mind, uh, may have come to his mind things that he has said that were not acceptable before the Lord. They were not as incense before the Lord, but they were sin. Uh, in James chapter 3, we see in verse 6, something about the tongue that we need, we're bringing before your remembrance. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Wow. Mm. Do we all have a tongue? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we all have a tongue. And every day we are saying things that uh, by God's grace should not be setting on fire. Nothing in your home, nothing in your job, nothing in your school, nothing in your community. Uh, you know, our words should be spoken with seasoned with grace, seasoned with grace. Mm -hmm. uh, notice it says in verse 10, uh, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Now, I want to bring you the other side. In Proverbs chapter, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 20, the tongue of the righteous is choice silver. Wow, that's marvelous. The heart of the wicked is worth little. So by the grace of the Lord, our tongues can utter words that are like choice silver, that are like uh, uh, of great influence, that are of benefit to others. May the Lord help us to do that and commit ourselves completely to the Lord, that our words throughout the day will bring, bring praise to the Lord and draw people to Jesus. Let's go back to Psalm 141 and verse 4. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity, and do not let me eat of their delicacies. Again, we have here, Powerful words to consider. Mm. Here, asking the Lord to help him not to incline the heart to any evil thing. In other words, let not uh, the evil tendencies carry me in such a way that I am going to practice evil works. The lesson brings out something powerful, and that is that this particular verse shows progression into the deceitfulness of wickedness. And apparently, David understood that his words and the things in his heart can build on and build on and get worse and worse in the sense that he would begin to practice evil things 
with those who work iniquity. Mm. And now, uh, we only have time to share with you Romans 12, verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Mm. This is a powerful prayer and should be uh, considered, meditated upon, and make it a prayer of your life to ask the Lord to consider your prayers as incense and to put a guard over your mouth and to help you in your heart so that you are not set into doing wicked things. The time has flown by for me as I've been listening <laughs> to this. This has been good. And uh, I've been blessed by each of these lessons, but we got one more to finish it off here. I'm Daniel Perrin and I have Thursday's lesson, Blessings of Righteous Living. Now the whole book of Psalms, 150 chapters, is organized into five collections or five books. And the very beginning of all five collections starts with this word, blessed. Now the book of Matthew, with the clearest links to the Old Testament, records five sermons of Jesus, like the five books of the Psalms or the five books of the Pentateuch. And the first of those five sermons, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 to 7, begins with blessed are the poor in spirit. Now the last book of the Bible records seven blessings, seven blesseds, the very final one in Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. So the whole book of Psalms, uh, the Hebrew title for the book of Psalms is Tehillim, praises. So the first praise, the first praise to God begins Psalm 1, verse 1, blessed. We get a picture that the life God desires for us is one of blessings. Amen. So blessed, and then we get the cause of it, is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Blessed is that person. So what does it mean to be blessed or blessed? Mm. We can dilute the meaning of words or we might do this when we say something when somebody sneezes, bless you mm. or bless your heart or we put blessed on mugs and vases and window decals and pillows and, and wall art and there's nothing wrong with that but we may lose sight of what the real picture of what is blessed. What is blessed? Now I'm going to do something here for a few minutes. I'm going to focus on some Hebrew words. The English word blessed in the Hebrew actually comes from two different words and it's the same in the Greek as well, but we're focusing on Hebrew. You have Esher and Barak. And I'm, if I had a whiteboard, I'd put Esher over here and everything related to it and Barak over here on this side. So I just pictured those. Now Psalm 1 verse 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. That is Esher, blessed. So Esher occurs 45 times in the Old Testament. It is translated usually as blessed or happy. It is the word for envious desire to be blessed, to be, to be Esher blessed, is to be in a good position that is enviously desirable. It's something that is good that people look at and they like it. The root word Osher means to go straight, to advance, to make progress. In other words, it is you taking steps to a good result that ends positively. It, it can be the, the carnal prosperity sometimes that some look at and say, good fortune, luck Lucky you, this is the happy, the blessed life. Now this word, Esher, is never used in connection with God because God does not Esher bless us because there's nothing in us that God enviously desires. He does not aspire to be like us. And there's nothing that, that we have that he wishes to have in that manner. Uh, in the same way, Esher is not used as uh, given from man toward God because we cannot be who God is. So it is reserved for man in the Bible. Now Barak, on the other hand, this is usually issued from the greater to the lesser. It, it, it denotes superiority. So a father can Barak bless a son, a king can Barak bless his subjects. And in this sense, humans can, as Psalms 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul, 
Not that we are superior, but we are acknowledging the superiority, the blessedness, the superior blessing of who God is. Psalm 1846, the Lord lives, blessed Barak, blessed be my rock. So ultimately, God is the source of all Barak blessings. He's the supreme cause, and any blessing that man could give is simply a reflection of where it comes from, the, the blessing that God gives, the Barak blessing. And so it is often used, Barak blessing, as a, a benediction, a bestowal, a giving of gifts. Since Barak, this kind of blessing, God initiates it, uh, he can also give it when we don't deserve it, when we've done nothing to warrant a gift from God. On the other hand, Esher, this blessing over here, happiness to be enviously desired, is not necessarily a gift given by God. It is the consequence of following God. It's the natural, the natural result of things that we do. Now, this is not saying that we're saved by our works, but that there are simply natural consequences to following God. And so when Esher blessing is spoken, it's more of a like a congratulations, a recognition of looking Look what the life of somebody who follows God is like. So here's the point. There is a blessing that, that God gives us that we cannot earn and he initiates. This is Barak. Genesis 1.22, the very first time we find this word in the Bible. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. They couldn't do that for themselves. Genesis 12.3, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's Barak given by God. God initiates this. God makes it happen. On the other hand, there is Esher blessing that is simply a recognition of the condition of the life of those who follow God, the consequence of following and obeying God. Here are some examples from Psalms. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed Esher is the man who trusts in him. Unequivocal choice to trust in God reaps the reward of what God gives. Psalm 41 verse 1, blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in times of trouble. This is our action, considering the poor. Psalm 84, 5, blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. Here's somebody who takes the steps to the sanctuary for the sacrifice and they receive the blessing and their life will be better, happier, joyous, enviable. Psalm 112, 1, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. If you love God's commandments, you'll be walking in your life in such a manner that there will be rewards that will be reaped simply because walking in God's way is the way that is going to produce a positive outcome. Psalm 119, verse one, I got a few more. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Here's a person who says, I'm gonna put myself totally under the authority of God. And when I'm under God's authority, then God's result is gonna be worked out in my life. And as we've seen, that's not always, as in the life of Joseph, gonna be in this moment, prosperity the way we may think of it. But when we look at the life of Joseph, we see, wow, that person lived a life and reaped the result of obedience to God. Let's do a couple more. Psalm 128, verse one and two. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy. There's the word, Esher again. And it shall be well with you. Here's a person who loves God's way and they labor. They're actually doing the work of righteousness. Psalm 146, five, happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help. Oh look, it's God doing it all along, but it results in blessing for us whose heart, oh wait, whose hope is in the Lord his God. And then finally, uh, Psalm 1, one and two, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So you are not earning anything, but Esher bless, blessing is the consequence of righteous living. 
And here's the title for this, for Thursday's lesson, The Blessings of Righteous Living. There is a consequence, there is a result. If you don't go stealing, you're not gonna get in trouble and it's envier, not to, enviable not to be in prison for, for whatever you've done than to be in prison. Mm. So it would be great, it'd be great if our English translations could make a differentiation here because the Hebrews who read this, they saw those words distinctly mm -hmm. different. The lesson comes for me in gardening. There is no crop that arises without the sun or the rain. That has to happen, but that does not come from me. That's a gift from God, that is Barak. But there is no crop that comes when a seed is not planted, the ground is not tilled, and the plants are not cared for. And that happens with me. God does not do that for me. There's a blessing that comes from me participating. So we cannot say, Lord, bless me. And well, God does, does bless us undeservedly, but say, Lord, bless me, and then we not participate. And so I listen to holy things. I watch holy things. I participate in holy things. And when I put my life in the condition where God can bless, when I do the things he can bless, then the blessing will be reaped. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Do what God can bless, and blessing will follow. Amen. Thank Amen. you so much, Daniel, Amen. Pastor Denzi, Pastor Rafferty, and Shelley. Uh, let's get some final thoughts. We've got a couple of minutes. Psalm 90, verse 12, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Realize how short this life is and what your inheritance, if you're in Christ Jesus, you have an inheritance in store for you, eternal life. Amen. And just like Joseph was tested and just like Moses was tested, we're going to be tested. Testimonies to the church, volume 5, 136. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. To fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our test. It, at this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. Thank you. Amen. I read to you from Psalm 141, verse 8 through 9, But my eyes are upon you, O God, the Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not leave my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares they have laid for me and from the traps of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I escape safely. I encourage you to put your eyes on the Lord. Take them off the world. Follow the Lord with all of your heart. Psalm 37, 22 says, For those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, and this is the final consequence of accepting the righteousness of Christ in our lives. Amen. I just want to read Jeremiah chapter 29 and verses uh, 11 through 14. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And when you seek me, you will find me. When you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you. Search for him with all your heart. That's what we've learned today. Put your meditation, your contemplation, your prayers, your life in the hands of the Lord and you will grow in him. You're not going to want to miss next week. Lesson number nine is entitled, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord.